<laughs> all right. Thank you, Amber. No, I mean, that's, John. that's all right. <laughs> we had it. We, we made a comment a, a couple of moments ago about um, him not being jet lagged and me suffering from sort of the last week at the ABC, which I think amounts to the same thing. <laughs> Ori. Indeed. Thank you, John, and I'm glad that you, uh, you brought up the 50,000 year spiritual history of this country and this continent because I visited the National Gallery up in Canberra yesterday and I was going to say there is a good deal of spirituality which is a lot older than 200 years here. So thank you for that, and thank you for confusing me with Emma Chellick. Um, you're the only one I ever know, I've ever met, who could be that jet lagged to have made that <laughs> confusion. I would like to <laughs> and Emmer is used to having the last word, so I hope he doesn't get an opportunity to come to this podium today. My, my remarks kind of fall into three groups of three, if I may put it that way, an appropriate enough number. Um, first, within my first trio, a very brief comment about spirituality and religion. It is an aspect of what we humans do and have been doing as far back as we can trace ourselves that derives from our sense that there is something beyond ourselves and not only something beyond ourselves but that that whatever it is has in some fundamental sense been responsible for us and for what we are it has created us it therefore also has the power to destroy us to help us to harm us to hinder us to further us to bless us to curse us and it has been historically the province the purpose of religion to connect us back to that whatever it is so that we are blessed and not cursed. The word religion comes from a Latin series of roots. L vowel G in Latin means a binding. R E means back or again. I O is just a suffix that indicates that it's an abstract noun. So religio in Latin is that which binds us again or binds us back to that source. And it is to repeat a universal human phenomenon there is none among us, culture and civilization-wise, going back 50,000 and more years for which that is not an important part of what we are. Second, mysticism has been, over the course of our history as a species, a kind of intensified subset of religion, but specifically, and again with respect to the term mysticism itself, Mystain in Greek means to close or by extension to hide. The mysterion is that which is hidden. And the mystic has the conviction that everyday garden variety religion, as it were, accesses the outer recesses of divinity that the mystic seeks to penetrate. The mystic seeks the inner hiddenmost recess of God, the mysterion. And understanding how paradoxic it is because it is impossible to do that, and yet it's absolutely possible and feasible to do that. Impossible to do it, but feasible and possible to do that. The mystic engages in whatever the particular process will be of accessing that mysterion. There is a threefold challenge. That is, how do I manage to access the mysterion? How do I come back from that access? And how do I articulate what the experience was, that last part being at least as important as the first two for reasons I'll state in a moment? There are also three, there's also a threefold kind of danger. If I can't come back from the experience of being outside myself, that's what ek stasis, again out of a Greek series of roots, means, ecstasy, to be outside myself, or alternatively, enstasis, deep within myself, not because it's the self that I find there, but God that I find there. If I can't come out of that, and if I can't somehow articulate what the experience was, how can I do what I actually really need to be doing in order to justify the process of seeking the mysterion? And that is benefiting those around me, helping the community around me. If my goal is just for my own enlightenment, then that's, as it were, a false goal, and the mystical enterprise won't work. Which leads me to the third aspect of the first part of my threefold series of three. And that is that one way of understanding and articulating what the mystical enterprise is, is that the mystic seeks to be filled with God. And in order to be filled with God, has to be emptied of self. The two 
consequences of which are, to repeat what I said a moment ago, if I'm in it for myself, that's too selfish, it won't work. It has to, at some level, be selfless as an enterprise. The danger is I still have to come back to myself in order to be able to help the world around me, which is what my point and purpose should be. The other aspect of this selflessness that must ideally be part of the mystical enterprise as an intensified aspect of the religious process is that the mystic has a golden opportunity to recognize that even if he or she is of a tradition that sees one God, as Jews, Christians, and Muslims, for example, are, that there can be an endless array of paths of tariqas to that one God, as opposed to the sectarian, self-focused, mine is the only way, my tradition is the only correct tradition, other traditions are not only other but inferior somehow to my own. And one sees the evidence of that possibility actually realized, for example, in the work of one of the most renowned of medieval Muslim mystics, a Sufi by the name of Jalaluddin Rumi, whose name is probably familiar to many of you. In the States, I understand more people read Rumi's poetry than any other text besides the Bible. And Rumi writes at one point, I go into the Muslim mosque and the Jewish synagogue and the Christian church and I see one altar. He writes, not Christian or Jew or Muslim, not Hindu, Buddhist, Sufi or Zen, not any religion or cultural system. I'm not from the East or from the West, not out of the ocean or up from the ground, not natural or ethereal, not composed of elements at all. I do not exist, am not an entity in this world or the next, did not descend from Adam and Eve or any origin story. My place is placeless, a trace of the traceless, neither body or soul. Now, the words that Rumi writes are words if, which you can recognize come through him, not from him. It is that he is filled with the voice of God who says through Rumi to anyone who is listening to or reading his poetry, whether in Farsi or in Turkish or in the original English, of course, um, <laughs> that the paths to God are endless. It would, after all, be odd in a world which is so extraordinarily diverse that is created by God, in which no two people look alike or act alike, no two flowers are identical, snowflakes are in their endless numbers different one from the other. It would be odd if there were only one correct path to God. And a mystic is one who has the particularly strong opportunity in having to empty self of self to be filled with God to recognize that sectarianism and religious prejudice are functions of ego, my ego, and not of God. That said, one might ask, so how does this play out in the 20th and 21st centuries, both in the verbal and conceptual sense and in the visual sense? We live in a world which, from the late 18th century, began to see itself in the West so often as devoid of spirituality, of stripped of religious concerns, a kind of culminating sense of which is expressed by thinkers like Nietzsche in the 1880s or Sartre in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, self-proclaimed existentialists who view, whose view it was that there simply is no God, that we don't need God, that we can do it all ourselves. Nietzsche could say that before World War I, before World War II, before all of the horrors of which we are, with which we are familiar by either having lived through or, or knowing historically of that last century, which has destroyed much uh, rather more human and other than human parts of creation than all the previous millennia combined. So he perhaps, but Sartre is odder in imagining that we don't need whatever that is, that we can function completely on our own. And one asks the question, well, are there others who have thought about this differently? And if I follow a kind of chronological order, for simplicity's sake, and turn for balance sake to one Jew, one Christian, one Muslim, isn't that a coincidence? Then my starting point could be and is Martin Buber, who grew up uh, at the very end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, as a very secularized Jew in Vienna, 
who ended up doing his PhD work on uh, Indian philosophy and religion, particularly Buddhism and Hinduism, and as a consequence became much more involved and interested in spirituality than he ever would have imagined when he began the enterprise. That led him to look to his own Jewish tradition, and so he began to explore and became one of the most important explicators of the last phase in the history of mysticism in the Jewish tradition known as Hasidism. But the work from which I want to quote and to which I want to refer is a work that really put him on a larger map written about 1930 called I and Thou, Ich und Du, I and You, because it does two things which at the time were and to a certain extent remains unique. And those two things are speaking without any consciousness of sectarian lines at all and using the very vocabulary of Nietzsche and Sartre and the existentialists that operate at the outset from the concept of human will. I can be and do whatever I want strictly from within myself, that's why I don't need God, and turn that into a spiritual kind of exercise. So he starts out in I and Thou, making an observation about how humans engage the world in a twofold manner. He refers to two primary words. One primary word is the combination I thou. The other primary word is the combination I it. So the I, capital I, not E-Y-E, of man is also twofold. For the I of the primary word I thou is a different I from that of the primary word I it. The primary word I thou can only be spoken with the whole being. The primary word I it can never be spoken with the whole being. There is no I taken in itself, but only the I of the primary word I thou and the I of the primary word I it. And he goes on to observe that the I it experience, excuse me, the I it way of being in the world is that you experience the world. So the world exists for my pleasure, for my need. It comes from within myself, and I experience it. It is a kind of hierarchy, me up here and everything else down there. I thou, he says, establishes the world of relation. To be in a relationship, it's an even playing field in which my I to your thou, I immediately recognize, is also your I to my thou. It's a constant cycle and circle. It is reciprocal. It is even. And he furthermore then observes that there are three spheres in which this world of relation can arise. The first is our life with nature, in which I engage with others at a level beneath speech, he says. So I have a relationship with my dog, I have a relationship with the tree outside my window, I have a relationship with my pet rock. And obviously neither my dog nor that tree nor my pet rock can communicate with me using the kind of language that I use. And yet, he says, I can engage in a relationship. It's not just that they exist for my benefit. It's not just an experience. The second is our life with humans. There the relation is open and in the form of speech. We can give and accept the thou. That's the most obvious level at which a re an I-thou relationship plays out. So we all can have, and hopefully do have, relationships in which I, thou, is communicated in the two directions simultaneously. And here's the kicker. The third is our life with spiritual beings. It does not use speech, yet begets it. We perceive no thou, but nonetheless we feel we are addressed and we answer. I can do it if I have both will and grace. So the issue that he is putting forth in the whole third part of this very long book from which I just read, you know, a few lines, is that if I can use my existentialist will to suspend for a moment my disbelief in God's existence, which as an existentialist is a central part of my thinking, if I am a Nietzschean, Sartre kind of existentialist, if I can suspend that disbelief for a moment through an act of will, I'll find God at the other side and it transcends language, that's the other part. And the other part within the other part is it takes will, and you notice he used the word grace, by which he means that because if I can suspend my will, I will find myself graced by an awareness of God's presence beyond words. 
along 30 years later comes a Christian, a Catholic thinker by the name of Thomas Merton. He actually grew up with combined, not particularly religious, Protestant and Catholic upbringing. He lost his mother early and then his father. And at the age, late in his teens, he found himself in a hotel room in Rome with his father's Bible in hand. A loss, at loss and adrift, not just in the spiritual sense, but in the fundamental, well, if I can use it, existential sense. And he picked up the Bible and his eye fell on a passage which started him in an entirely new direction. And Merton ends up not only becoming one of the more important Catholic thinkers, but he becomes a monk and a mystic. He ends up in, um, in a monastery in the southeastern United States, as a matter of fact. But he finds himself compelled to write. And he worries that the act of committing himself to paper is too strongly an act of ego. So he keeps consulting with his abbot, and his abbot says, no, 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 this is a gift from God. This is your gift, and it is important for us as a monastic order and for the spiritual world at large that you write what you're writing, that you help engage people in the process in which you and we have been engaged. And Merton finds himself very quickly drawn simultaneously as Rumi, who is an emphatic Muslim, and yet this universalist in his thinking, as Buber, who has come back to his Jewish roots and is universalist in his thinking as he writes, I thou, Merton, who remains a committed Catholic, ab absolutely, is at the same time drawn to other faiths or to explore other faiths and to recognize other faiths as offering a validity at the same level as what Catholicism offers to him, and he spends time in Southeast Asia. He spends time studying with certain gurus associated with certain sects of Buddhism, and he becomes interested in Hinduism. And around 1961-62, he writes a work called uh, New Seeds of Contemplation, one section of which is entitled We Are One. And in this section, he writes, I cannot treat other men as men, Unless, and he is using the word men, I think, gender-free, so I'll stick with his text and not try and uh, edit it. I can treat other men as men unless, I cannot treat them unless I have compassion for them. Compassion, another Latin-based word, patio is to feel, com with, compassion is to feel with. It's Greek equivalent you all know, sympathos. Sympathy and compassion are the same word. They mean to feel with. I must have at least enough compassion to realize that when they suffer, they feel somewhat as I do when I suffer. And if for some reason I do not spontaneously feel this kind of sympathy for others, then it is God's will that I do what I can to learn how. I must learn to share with others their joys, their sufferings, their ideas, their needs, their desires. I must learn to do this <clears throat> not only in the cases of those who are of the same class, the same profession, the same race, the same nation as myself. But when men who suffer belong to other groups, even to groups that are regarded as hostile, if I do this, I obey God. If I refuse to do it, I disobey him. Compassion teaches me that my brother and I are one. A few years later, in 1966, he writes a work called Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, in which he asserts, I will be a better Catholic, not if I can refute every shade of Protestantism, but if I can affirm the truth in it and still go further. So too with the Muslims, the Hindus, the Buddhists, etc. If I affirm myself as a Catholic merely by denying all that is Muslim, Jewish, Protestant, Hindu, Buddhist, etc., in the end I will find that there is not much left for me to affirm as a Catholic, and certainly no breath of the spirit with which to affirm it. And he had written a few years before that to Cheslav Milos a letter in which he says, in which he wrote, I cannot be a Catholic unless it is made quite clear to the world that I am a Jew and a Muslim, unless I am execrated as a Buddhist and denounced for having undermined all that this comfortable and social Catholicism stands for. So Merton is a poster child for the aspect of mysticism that involves the emptying of self from self, the 
diminution to, the, to an infinitesimal nothingness of one's own ego, which allows one to open up to recognize how important a range of traditions is in the matter of engaging God. And if I turn the chronological clock forward another generation or so to the 1990s and the, into the 21st century, and I turn to the Turkish Muslim philosopher, theologian, Sufi, and writer on Sufism, and at the present moment, object of enormous uh, attacks from the Turkish government, Fatullah Gülen, and the movement of which he is the inspiration, I find a similar series of ways of thinking expressed in a range of different times, places, um, and ways. So Gulen writes, for example, um, if I can, yes. He writes, tolerance, and alas, that's a poor translation. The word hoshkeru means that you see the best in others. And that has typically been translated as tolerance, but it's really embrace. But I'll stick with my text and not edit it, but I'll tell you why the, the translation is off. Hoshkeru, a term which we sometimes use in place of the words respect, mercy, generosity, or forbearance, is the most essential element of moral systems. It is a very important source of spiritual discipline and a celestial virtue of perfected people. Those who do not embrace all of humankind with hoshkaru, with seeing the best in people and forgiveness, have lost their worthiness to receive forgiveness and pardon. If true Muslims observe such Quranic principles as the following and were to go on their way and tolerate curses deep in their breasts, then others would appear in order to implement the justice of destiny on those who cursed us. So Muslim is defined by Gulen as someone who conforms to this description of hoshkaru, of embracing others by re recognizing the good in all of them. And he writes further in the context of observing that words to oneself need to be the beginning of words that involve others, that the goal of dialogue among world religions is not simply to destroy scientific materialism and the destructive materialistic worldview. Rather, the very nature of religion demands this dialogue. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, as well as Hinduism and other world religions, accept the same source for themselves and including Buddhism, pursue the same goal. So his starting point in his writing has to do with words and has to do with thought. But he very quickly translates those concepts into something more active. He says, in the end, words, words are words. It's actions that matter. So he talks about those who would follow his thinking being engaged in altruistic, and that's the term he again and again uses, an altruistic way of being in the world that leads to, and the Turkish word with which you are all familiar, hizmet, meaning service, leads to hizmet, leads to serving others rather than oneself. Not surprisingly, he is very much connected to the thinking of Rumi and to Ibn Arabi and to others actually from Socrates to Said Nursi to Einstein in his thinking very much having to do with this notion not only of a broad perspective, but one that leads from words to actions. In Socrates' terms, from logos to ergon, to hizmet. If such people reflect, can reflect this duty of service and responsibility in the work and service that they carry out, if they're able to pursue the essence of the fundamental principles of existence and obey our orders concerning rules of conduct, rather than binding themselves to the consequences of their actions. So don't worry about whether your hizmet leads somewhere. It will. But the point is to be engaged in service, not to be worrying about the outcome of the service that you are providing to those around you. Then the, any unexpected outcome will not cause them to feel defeated, nor will their enthusiasm wane. And you can imagine that these are the kinds of thoughts that are very much in his head and those of his followers in these days when they are being hunted down inside and outside of Turkey, both verbally and in some places otherwise, by the uh, forces um, of Mr. Erdogan um, and the current Turkish regime. What 
Gulen ultimately concludes taking a phrase from Rumi to become the light is that in the end, God promises that as we come to fully recognize that goodness, beauty, truthfulness, and being virtuous lie in the essence of the world, then whatever happens, the world will one day find this essence and no one will be able to prevent that, the shining of the light, the leading of the world toward perfection from happening. He is drawn by inspiration to repeat to many thinkers, none more profoundly than the one with whom I began, Rumi, who wrote, come, come and join us as we are the people of love devoted to God. Come, come through the door of love and join us and sit with us. Come, let us speak one to another through our hearts. Let us speak secretly without eyes and ears. Like thought, let us see each other without any words or sounds. So love as a centerpiece for the thinking of Gulen, love for all of humanity because his starting point is love of God. And how can you love God if you don't love all of humanity when God is by definition embedded in all of us? That's what each of these traditions teaches. And second, but it's not only about words. And it's not only about words because it's also about actions. It's also not only about words because words sometimes are limited and limiting in what we can do. With that in mind, I wrap up with the last part of my remarks, turning to the visual arts, offering as far back as we can trace the human experience an alternative means and mode of addressing that other reality which is addressed by religion in terms that transcend words. If I could have the first image, and so in looking at the 20th and the 21st centuries, and again, looking at it through a threefold lens, in pure chronological terms, the first image I choose dates from 1961-62, so it's around the same time that Merton was writing um, his New Seeds of Contemplation. It's a work by the Iranian artist, a Shi'i Muslim artist by the name of Charles Hussein Zenderudi, and it's called The Hand. Its subtitle is Saka Khane, which uh, in Farsi means the, the water fountain. And it is a work that operates on several levels simultaneously. You may recognize, for example, that the framing around the periphery is marked by what at least gives the appearance of Farsi. Um, and if your eyes are particularly good, you can see that there's an entire lengthy text variously laid out on some of the threefold elements that are within the image in a kind of silvery color and certainly across the whole golden background. And the work is a work that was done during the time, if you remember your Middle Eastern history, when the Shah had assumed um, an, an increasingly, not only uh, an increasing position of power, but of oppression. Thanks to MI6 and even more so the CIA, he had created Savak, which um, would make the KGB look like child's play in terms of its infiltration into everyday people's lives. And so this is in part intended as a political statement. How so? Because the hand is doing double duty, actually treble duty. The first aspect of it, which connects to the whole background, is that it is a a symbol that has a long history within Islamic art. It is actually a symbol that precedes Islam, Judaism, Christianity. It goes back thousands of years across the Middle East and uh, North Africa. Typically, there will be two hands that stand in for the image of the priest or priestess who intermediates between us and Baal, Marduk, the god who is in charge. In the Muslim tradition, the hand, referred to as the khamsa, an Arabic word simply meaning five, thus emphasizing the fiveness of the hand, is a double symbol of Islam in that the five fingers connote the five pillars of Islam from prayer to pilgrimage. And on the other hand, the construction of the hand with a thumb that is separate from the four fingers suggests the relationship in abstract terms between God and ourselves, the one God symbolized by the thumb that is both disconnected from and yet connected to the rest of the hand with its four fingers symbolized in the four directions, east, west, north, of our reality. So that's one level, 
a broad, you might say, history of Muslim art kind of level at which the hand is a hand. But in the context of Persian history, it is a direct reference to a moment which for Persians, for Iranians, is after the moments within the life of the Prophet himself, arguably the most important religious moment in their history. The last of the four followers, the four companions, Ali, the last of the four Rashidun who followed uh, Muhammad, is um, perishes and a new dynasty asserts itself in Damascus, the Umayyad dynasty that does not come either from the line of the Rashidun in the conceptual sense or the line of Ali in the, uh, in the genealogical sense. And the battle of Karbala in 680 is a battle in which the son of Ali, a guy by the name of Hussein, that would make him the grandson of Muhammad himself, is engaged in a desperate struggle against Yazid I, the Umayyad caliph, self-proclaimed caliph, and his followers, and of course his small force is crushed by this large army. There is a moment when the half-brother of Hussein, a fellow by the name of um, uh, um, Hazrat Abbas, whose hands have been chopped off, keeps going back and forth to the Euphrates River to bring water for his troops who are dying and in, at that moment in particular suffering from great thirst. So he becomes the subject of many, many subsequent accounts and the consummate symbol of martyrdom of the sort that causes you to serve others no matter how much pain you yourself are experiencing. And in the context of the era of the Shah, the idea of the recollection of Karbala is to suggest that crushed though we may be by the policies of a, by the way, very secularizing Shah, we can still maintain and ultimately commit ourselves to serving each other um, on behalf of that for which um, God and God's relationship with us stands. But all, all of this, at the same time, is connected to yet another handling of the hand hand, which is it rises from a six-pointed star, which in turn rises from a ewer of water. The ewer of water is that sakhane, it is that fountain of water that connotes Hazrat Abbas and Karbala, but it is also intended to suggest the baptismal font of Christianity, and sandwiched between the Muslim and the Christian symbol, the six-pointed star is intended to suggest the Star of David as a Jewish symbol. So it is a self-professed presentation of a trifocal vision of an ideal Iran in the context of that time period, 1961-62, which was so uncomfortable for Iranians across the religious spectrum. Next image, please. If on the second hand, I turned from a Muslim to a Christian artist and jump about 30 years forward, I get to a fellow by the name of Anselm Kiefer. Um, if you get a chance to go over to Kember, it's not that far away. The National Gallery there has a magnificent Kiefer that I just saw yesterday. I saw, I didn't only see indigenous art, I also saw a few other things. Um, and Kiefer is a German Christian born in 1945. Germany in the 20th century psychologically and in a certain fundamental historical sense divides itself into what's called before and after. Before World War II and the Holocaust and after. So Kiefer is what's called nachgeboren, an afterborn, and typical of a child brought up in Germany in the late 40s, 50s, early 60s. He learned, he heard, he knew nothing of the Holocaust because Germany at that point in time disacknowledged that the event had even occurred, much less its role in perpetrating it. By the end of the 60s, this is information that has somehow, not just somehow, leaked out big time. And he is among the young Germans who is shocked to realize that aspect of his national history. And he becomes particularly obsessed with Jewish mysticism. And many of his works reflect on that. And this particular work, which is why I've chosen this, called Tsim Tsum from 1990. This one is actually in our National Gallery in Washington, D.C., although I may be asking for asylum and won't be able to say ours. Anyway, <laughs> we'll have to see where the next few weeks go. Um, Tsim Tsum is a word which in Hebrew means contraction. 
in the 16th century, in the late part of the middle section of the history of Jewish mysticism, that middle section called Kabbalah, in the late part in a little town called Safed, Sfat in the Galilee in what is today Israel, there is a group that was gathered around a guy by the name of Isaac Luria. And there are many things that are interesting with respect to Luria's understanding of our place in the world. He wrote nothing. He was there for only three years before he died of fever, so we don't even have that much. We have nothing from him and relatively little about him, but yet we have a lot of important things. And there are two concepts that are particularly interesting, I think, for our discussion that he floated. One was the absolute importance of what he called tikkun olam, the fixing or repairing of a world which is self-evidently broken, and the obligation of all of us to leave the world a better place than it was when we were born into it. And he connected that directly to his mystical thinking, which is that the point of our mystical relationship with God is to come out of that experienced relationship and improve the community around me and not just myself. It's a concept which predates him, but he, it's a concept that he, within the rabbinic tradition, but it's a concept that he really runs with. The second is this. I would say the central question that you find historically in Jewish mysticism is how did God create the world? God is singular and visible and tangible without access to the, with, inaccessible to the senses. And yet the world is everything but that, endlessly multifariable, uh, endlessly multifarious, defined by the senses and the intellect. Everything that God is, the world seems not to be and vice versa. And the standard operating explanation prior to Luria was emanation. Out of an infinitesimally spaceless point, as it were, God emanates by letters, by numbers, out into what becomes our reality. Luria says the question is slightly misasked and therefore the answer is wrong. The real question is, how is there room for the world when God is everything, everywhere? And his answer was, therefore, it's simsum, contraction. God withdraws itself into an infinitesimal point that cannot even be measured by a microscope to make room for the world. So simsum is on the surface, and quite literally, he has the name written across the top there, by its title about that contraction which pertains to God and the universe and the creative process. But of course, he's punning on all kinds of levels. He grew up in a Germany from which the Jews had contracted into, dis into disappearance, and yet he was hearing anti-Semitic comments from his parents and their friends all the time. How come? There are no Jews here. They can't be responsible for all our, all our problems. They're not here. He found that paradoxic. Eventually, of course, as he found out about the Holocaust, it acquired a different tonality to him. And this painting reflects on the Holocaust in a, semi, uh, in a subtle, semi-abstract manner so that you can see um, there is the hint of a tower here. And all of these diagonals, if one has seen by 1990, he would have a good deal of the iconic imagery pertaining to the Holocaust. The tower is the tower at Auschwitz. The diagonals are the train tracks terminating at that tower, which is, of course, the contraction, vanishing, disappearing point for all those Jews during the Holocaust. There's more. He's also a student of art history. And in art history, one of the questions that is approached by the 15th and 16th centuries in Italy in what we call the Renaissance is how can the artist working in two dimensions give the viewer the illusion that you're not looking at a flat surface but that you're looking through a window as it were into space. And a guy by the name of Alberti wrote a treatise on painting in 1435 in which he says you can structure canvas by asserting a kind of horizon line whether it's exterior interior and a series of orthogonals of diagonal lines going toward that horizon line from out in and from above from out in. And that will create, when you fill it all out with your shapes and your colors and the like, it will give your viewer the illusion of seeing figures that are volumetric and three-dimensional in space and on a flat surface. But the point where all the orthogonals meet is called the vanishing point. 
So the vanishing point is the vanishing of the Jews. The vanishing point is the question of the vanishing of God because the big post-Holocaust question that Jewish and Christian theologians ask by the 70s and 80s and 90s is, where is God in the context of a million children being fried? Is it God who vanished or disappeared? Or is that the wrong question? Since God didn't build the ovens, it was humans who built the ovens. So maybe the wrong question is the God question. Maybe the right question is, what are we? Who are we? So Kiefer is addressing all of this from a perspective that is by no means strictly Christian, nor is it for that matter Christian and Jewish. It is universal and human. Last image, please. Which brings me to a Jewish artist, Siona Benjamin from India. He lives now in the United States, has for years. Grew up in, uh, in Mumbai, Bombay, um, in a community which was primarily Hindu and Muslim. Went to Zoroastrian and Catholic schools. Came to the United States, married uh, a Jew from Eastern Europe moved from the Midwest to New Jersey, realized that the United States has issues that she thought only India has, like sexism, racism, religious prejudices, was shocked when she went to her first feminist conference to find Western women shocked that she spoke English because she came from the barbaric East, you know, India, and um, shocked that she knew things and thought things that they thought, well, really, you, from where you come from? And she writes, and she's said this many times, I felt my skin turning blue when they would ask these kinds of questions. And the work that she does is consistently a work that reflects both on the various sources of her own self, but also on the effort that she says her art is all about to be part of the instrumentation for improving the world by drawing from and pitching out to universal principles by way of very specific images and ideas. So the portrait is a self-portrait, and the portrait is a portrait of every person. And she's got dozens and dozens of these female figures that she calls fereshta, which in Urdu means angels, messengers between that reality and our own. And the blue, of course, is most obviously a reference to the portraiture, the imagery, rather, in Hindu art of Krishna, but at the same time, not only are other gods, there are goddesses who are portrayed sometimes in that blue. And more to the point, she says, but it's also the color of the sky. It's the same sky everywhere. And she typically gives us figures, some more so than this, in which you can see the influence of Islamic art in terms of very elaborate backgrounds. This one far less so than other works. But in which figures such as this one assume a kind of stance with a position, a mudra, which is recognizable from Hindu art. Shiva Nataraj, who dances the dance with, that destroys in order to make possible the reconstruction and therefore the continuation of our reality with multiple arms, but in this case, the arms number seven, like those in uh, the menorah, the seven-branched candelabrum, which is the most consistent and constant symbol in Jewish art going back two millennia. But each of the seven arms of the menorah, as you can see, see terminates in a hamsa stylized from 1, 4 to 3, 2, very common in Muslim art as well for aesthetic purposes. Instead of keeping the pure 4, 1 relationship, you end up with a 3, 1, 1 relationship. That's what she's got sevenfold with stylized candles, as it were, emanating from those hamsas that emanate from those arms of the menorah, that emanate from this figure, which is at once Siona, Efereshta, humankind, Shiva, Krishna, and the inscription right and left informs us very clearly about what it's about. So to our right, it says in Hebrew, tikkun ha'olam, that very phrase that I referenced from Isaac Luria. And what does it say on the other side? Tikkun ha'olam. She's used Devanagri, the writing system that one uses for Sanskrit, for Hindi, for example, reflecting that part of her reality but she simply transliterated the same phrase. So it's the same phrase in two different writing systems on the two sides of this universalistic kind of image. So it would seem that the opportunities as we move deeper into the 21st century to think simultaneously in the specifics of our specific traditions and subsets of those traditions and of universal principles that recognize how much more we have from wherever we are 
and however we are in common than are the things that separate and divide us, that the opportunities are present in art as they are present in thought and inshallah, as we say in French, are present in our world regardless of where its political directions might seem at the moment to be taking us. Thank you all very much.